All set? One sec. Okay, let me know. Good to go. Thanks. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order at 7.04 p.m. Uh, we'll do a quick roll call. Uh, Dave Calavecchio? Here. Roxy Finer? Here. Frank Treglia? Here. Sarah Ethier? Here. Heather Patchell? Here. Matt Van Ormer? Sal Santa Maria? Jennifer will not be present. Matt, are you with us yet? All right, we'll just watch for Matt um, to join. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, the approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion? This is Roxy Finer. I make a motion to and accept to approve the agenda of the Board of Education dated February 8, 2021 as presented. Matt Van Ormer, second. Is there any discussion on the motion? We'll vote by content, uh, consent, sorry. Um, are there any opposed? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. The next item is public participation. There uh, were no items submitted for public participation for this meeting. Uh, item number five is the approval of minutes. Um, we have four motions that need to be made. Do we have a motion for the um, to accept and approve the special meeting minutes of the Board of Education dated January 4th, 2021 as presented? This is Roxy Finer. I vote to accept approve the special meeting minutes of the Board of Education dated January 4th, 2021 as presented. Is there a second? I will second it, Frank. Any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. This um, is Roxy Finer. Thanks. I vote to accept approve the special meeting minutes of the Board of Education dated January 8th, 2021 as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. This is Roxy Finer. I vote to accept approve the emergency meeting minutes of the Board of Education dated January 19th, 2021 as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Dave Calvecchio abstains. Motion carries. This is Roxy Finer. I vote to accept approve the special meeting minutes of the Board of Education dated January 25th, 2021 as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? 
Motion carries. Next, we will move on to the recognitions. We have our January Rotary Student of the Month that we will be recognizing tonight. Um, Elijah Dwyer is being recognized as the January Rotary Student of the Month. This recognition comes as a result of Elijah's hard work in and out of the classroom. Elijah certainly deserves the recognition as an active and valuable member of our student body for his extracurricular activities and his willingness to help out on any project. On behalf of the Rotary Club, Elijah and his parents will be invited to a luncheon to honor Elijah at a date and time to be determined. On behalf of the Board of Education, Elijah will receive a Barnes and Noble gift card and a certificate in the mail for his outstanding achievement. Elijah was not able to join us this evening. Congratulations and keep up the great work. Um, next, we have the January Students of the Month for all the schools. And we'll start with Kindergarten. Student of the Month is Logan Kennedy. First grade, Owen Hawley. Second grade, Ava Nemetz. Third grade, Scarlett Alvey. Fourth grade, Britta Sagapi. Fifth grade, Jack Holloway. Sixth grade, Taylor Stadalnik. Seventh grade, Addison Patchell. Eighth grade, Scott Lanzara. Ninth grade, Valia Russman. Tenth grade, Kylie Decker. 11th grade, Kayla Johnson, and 12th grade, Patrick Riley, uh, 12th grade, Anna Calavecchio, 12th grade, Elizabeth Marble, and 12th grade, Kirsten Sundell. Congratulations. Um, we also have a recognition of a staff member which is Miss Susan Larson, the reading interventionist at the Center School. Um, the Look for Good Hero Award is a $1,000 annual scholarship in memory of Margaret Worthen, who had a stroke shortly before her college graduation. Margaret experienced severe limitations on her speech and mobility for nine years until her death. During this time, she managed to articulate seven words to her caregivers, including the words, Thank you. Her kindness is what inspired 150,000 children in 35 states to write You Matter letters to their friends and caregivers through our school-wide gratitude campaign program. Each Look for the Good Hero that we honor has embodied Margaret's resilience, generosity, and kindness. Ms. Larson, the reading interventionist at the Center School, received the National Look for the Good Heroes Award for the Look for the Good Project. The Look for the Good Project is a nonprofit organization that provides social emotional learning programs to K through six schools. On behalf of the Thomaston Board of Education and Superintendent Koss, Sue, we congratulate you. And we do have a plaque for you for your recognition um, to give you in person. So congratulations again. And next we have our presentations. Um, the first one is uh, the SRBI handbook. Beth, this is Francine speaking. Mm -hmm. I wanna take a moment to um, bring to your attention that Jennifer Razabal is one of our uh, newest staff members this year. She's a math intervention teacher and she is also uh, studying um, to be an administrator and therefore is doing some research in that area. And she has brought a project related to her work to Thomaston Public Schools. And what it has yielded is a fantastic handbook that she's going to be presenting. Um, Jessica uh, Badosky is her supervisor. And I'd like to uh, give Jessica the opportunity if she'd like to say a little bit more before Jennifer begins her presentation. 
Uh, yes, I would. Thank you. Um, so Jennifer, Jen approached me a couple of months ago regarding our SRBI handbook that had not been updated, I believe, since either 2004 or 2007. And um, this is an area of expertise. She's coming to us from Southington Public Schools, where she did a lot of work with SRBI, and she'll explain what that is. But I thought in our time where we went remote for a couple of weeks that it would be a great time to invest in um, updating the handbook and also our processes and systems in our respective schools so that students who need uh, intervention in language arts, math, or if they need um, some support around their behavior can have um, a specific protocol for staff to follow and so that our, our stakeholders, our parents, board of ed members will know how we're going to approach students who need any type of intervention. So it was really wonderful for her to come forth and say that she would lead this project. And she's done an amazing job as you'll see tonight. The project continues as we still have a couple of things to, um, to do after the handbook, but I'm just happy that um, it will be updated and very clear for parents and all the stakeholders in the community to know that we are very uh, purposeful in assisting those kids who, who need uh, a little bit more help. So thanks, Jen. And I hope um, that you all enjoy this presentation. Thank you so much for those kind words. I'm going to take a second to share my screen. I don't believe I have access to share my screen. Okay, hold on just one moment, Jen, while the host gets you that access. Thank you. No, one second, sorry. Um, can you just let me know if you can see my screen? We can. Okay, great. So good evening, everybody. My name is Jennifer Rosable, and I am a K-6 math intervention teacher at Black Rock School. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to share the Thomaston SRBI handbook with you tonight. As we navigate through the educational challenges the pandemic's brought on, a standardized process for SRBI is even more crucial now than ever. I'm presenting tonight on behalf of the entire SRBI committee, which includes Jessica Bedoski, Director of Curriculum, Instruction and Assessment, Gianni Perugini, Assistant Principal, Thomaston High School, Jonathan Kozlak, Principal, Black Rock School, Susan Larson, Reading Interventionist, Center School, Steve Malo, Counselor, Thomaston High School, Brianna Rialano, Counselor, Thomaston High School, and Cheyenne Clark, Grade One, Black Rock School. Our vision for SRBI is that Thomaston Public Schools will provide all students access to grade level curriculum through differentiated supports and interventions. It's critical to note that Thomaston's plan and process for SRBI put forth in this handbook is a proactive approach to meeting our students' individual needs both within and outside of the general education classroom. SRBI is a whole child approach 
which includes academics as well as behavior. Often when we hear the term intervention, we think of it as being a reactive approach to identifying students who have already fallen behind and providing them with remedial support. Our vision and process, however, is vastly different. Our goals are to improve tier one instruction, thus reducing students requiring tier two or three interventions or being referred to the special education process. To assist all students in achieving grade level proficiency by asking what are the barriers and how do we overcome them. To identify students who are at risk of falling behind and providing interventions proactively, ultimately exiting those students from the SRBI process after having met their designated goal. To provide a standardized approach, identify students with learning abilities if they are not making adequate growth through the SRBI process. To engage families. The goal is ultimately to identify students before they fall behind and to provide them with the supports needed to be proficient in their grade level curriculum. An overview for the SRBI process can be found on page four in the handbook. Response to intervention is a systematic approach for assessing the needs of performing students who have not been identified to receive special education services. In Connecticut, response to intervention is referred to as scientific research-based intervention, or SRBI. The overarching goal of SRBI is to assist all students in achieving grade level proficiency and to provide a standardized approach to identify students with learning disabilities. The pillars or main components of SRBI include a high quality curriculum, tier one instruction, a comprehensive assessment plan, and tiered intervention. More information on the pillars can be found on page seven in the handbook. High quality curriculum involves the content to be taught, level of depth and rigor of that content, and a timeline of when the content should be taught. Tier one instruction is the delivery of that highly effective curriculum through research-based instructional strategies, including differentiation to meet the individualized needs of each student. Assessment has many purposes in the SRBI process. One purpose is to identify students who are struggling or at risk based on designated benchmarks and criteria. These can be found on page 21 of the handbook. To determine students' education needs to inform instruction and intervention. To monitor the progress of interventions and to determine the overall effectiveness of tier one instruction. Tiered intervention. We can eliminate systemic reasons for low academic performance and focus on identifying and addressing the needs of individual students through tiers of intervention when an effective curriculum is present, when instruction is appropriate and differentiated, and assessments are used effectively. This table can be found on page nine in the handbook and it summarizes the different tiers of intervention. Tier one is the general education classroom. Every student in a classroom receives tier one instruction. It is also the general education classroom where students receive tier one intervention. The classroom teacher is responsible for differentiating instruction within the classroom and providing tier one interventions. Tier two is a more focused intervention. 
It can occur either in the regular education classroom or in a support service environment. The person responsible may be the classroom teacher or it may be a specialized teacher such as an interventionist. In tier two, student group sizes do not exceed six. And generally, the groups would meet two to three times weekly. Tier three is the more intensive intervention and it takes place in a support service environment by a highly skilled teacher of reading or math. Group sizes are smaller in tier three intervention and should not exceed three students. The duration in tier three may be for a longer period of time during each meeting, or it may occur more frequently. The SRBI process flow chart can be found on page 14 of the SRBI handbook. The SRBI process begins with tier one instruction and intervention at the top. All students receive tier one. Over to the right, if learning, performance, and behavior meets expectations, then students will continue with their tier one intervention and instruction. If we look to the left, we'll see learning, performance, and or behavior does not meet expectations. If that's the case, the classroom teacher will meet and collaborate with an interventionist, a coach, or a specialist to review the tier one interventions and to come up with a plan for the student's instructional or behavioral support prior to an SRBI referral. After collaborating with the interventionist, coach, or specialist, the classroom teacher will implement the strategies. After implementing strategies, the specialist interventionist or coach will meet with the classroom teacher to discuss whether or not student has made adequate progress with those strategies. If the student has made adequate progress, they will continue with their tier one instruction. If insufficient progress with tier one is supported um, and is evidenced by data, the SRBI team um, will meet after the classroom teacher makes a formal SRBI referral in frontline RTI. At that meeting, the SRBI team will determine the student's eligibility based on qualifying criteria, which is outlined in the handbook on page 22. If a student qualifies for tier two interventions, after four to six weeks um, of progress monitoring, the team will meet and decide if the student is making adequate growth and has met their goals, they will return to tier one. If the student's making adequate growth but has not yet met the intervention goals, they will continue with the tier two interventions. Below, if insufficient progress is made and it's evidenced by data, the team will meet first to modify the goals and strategies before moving to tier three. After the goals and strategies have been modified, if the student shows adequate progress with the new goals, they will continue with the tier two interventions. If a student shows inadequate progress with the new goals and strategies, the student will move to a more intense tier three intervention. After four to six weeks in the tier three intervention, the team will meet again to discuss student progress. If the student is, has made adequate progress and met the tier three intervention goals, they will be returned to tier two. If they are making adequate progress but have not yet met their goals, they will continue with tier three interventions. If inadequate progress is made with tier three interventions, at that point, the team may decide to move forward with a referral to special education. So having the standardized process is extremely important 
in ensuring we have a safety net. So we are accountable for the strategies that we're implementing and making sure that students are making the growth that is needed. During the team meetings, the decision-making guidelines include decisions such as whether or not to increase interventions, decrease interventions, maintain the current interventions, or it might be decided that more information is needed before a decision is made. So they may decide to gather more information and then reconvene at a later time to make that decision. Next steps are upon approval of the handbook, staff will begin training on frontline RTI and the new process. There will be an addendum for Thomaston High School. The SRBI process is more complex at the secondary level and we did not want to rush this critical work. The committee will continue to meet and evaluate the processes and make any modifications needed at that time. And Jess, I'm not sure if there's anything that you wanted to add. Uh, no, I didn't want to add anything. I just wanted to say that that, that um, thank you for condensing the handbook into a more reasonable. <laughs> um, the handbook is, I think, over 30 pages, something like that, Jen. So if any board member would like to look at it in more detail, you can do that. Um, but we just wanted to condense it and give you the highlights um, of the handbook. Thank you for the presentation. Um, are there any questions um, for Jen or Jessica? Do we have a motion to accept and approve the Thompson Public School Scientific Research Base Handbook as presented? This is Roxy Finer. I vote to accept and approve the Thomaston Public Schools Scientific Research Based Handbook as presented. This is Sarah Ethier. I'll second. Is there any discussion on the motion? I would like to point out, Beth, this is Francine speaking. I would like to point out. Um, or highlight what Jennifer already said, which is our plan is a stronger plan because it doesn't concentrate on just the one uh, main focus. Uh, we are not using it in a reactive way. It's also a proactive plan. And for those um, of the public who are listening, um, it is quite an impressive plan because it also affects mm -hmm. and um, helps to improve day-to-day -day instruction in that tier one classroom, which tier one classrooms are all classrooms. Jennifer, did I, did I misspeak at that? No, you're absolutely correct. Um, the purpose behind our SRBI was to improve the tier one while simultaneously um, working with students that required additional support. So we have much to be proud of with this plan because it catches the broadest group of students. It casts the widest net to bring improvement to the district. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Is there any opposed? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Uh, the Is there any other presentations? Um, I just wanna make sure I don't skip over anything. The student reports are next. Uh, the oh, only oh. other presentation will be part of my report. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will move on to the student representatives report. Do we have um, Caesar McKenna, anybody? 
for the academics, THS academics are carrying on as usual with the one new change being the new way of handling snow days. THS for the past month has now done two virtual learning snow days where students follow schedules similar to the remote Wednesdays. The new idea of remote learning snow days is proving to be effective as many teachers already have the tools and knowledge needed to teach classes remotely. Other than the new snow day plan, THS academics have continued as normally as possible while still keeping the necessary COVID-19 precautions. And next we have clubs. So NHS hosted also award presentations during advisory on February 4th, where winners were announced through Google slideshows. AV Club has been giving daily morning announcements, whether that be through email or the YouTube live streams. And Student Council and Interact Club have also been meeting to discuss future fundraisers and other projects. As McKenna is unable to be here due to sports practice, I shall read on her behalf. Basketball and indoor track practices have begun. Girls and boys basketball will each have their first game on February 8th, 2021. They'll be facing Litchfield, girls away, and boys home. Indoor track practices have begun with no meets in the near future due to COVID, and cheerleading practices have well, as well have in plans to cheer at home games. And just to add on to the athletics, I know that the girls did win tonight, so yay. And then the only other thing for special events is that the class of 2024 is selling carnations during lunch for Valentine's Day. And that is all. Great. Thank you, Caesar and Isabella. Uh, we will move on to the chairperson's report. Um, the first item under the chairperson's report um, is a request for clarification from board members on the definition of um, the emergency meeting that we held January 19th, 2021. Um, just wanted to have a brief discussion on that. There were some concerns from a board member um, regarding the emergency meeting. Um, there was also a request from another board member that um, we have our discussion here at this meeting. So, um, just wanted to briefly say that the purpose of our emergency meeting on um, February 19th was held and called an emergency meeting because we did not have time to post the minutes to the public within the, um, the required time frame over the Martin Luther King holiday weekend. So um, based on the Board of Education bylaws, policy 9321, the meeting um, that was called an emergency meeting um, can be called an emergency meeting since it cannot be posted to the town clerk within the requisite time due to the weekend holiday. The definition of an emergency meeting is as follows. An emergency meeting shall be called by the chairperson whenever deemed necessary. The notice of the meeting may be verbal or in writing. The notice shall indicate the time, place, and the nature of the emergency. Discussion at the emergency meeting shall be limited to the topics identified in the call to the meeting. Um, I know that uh, certain board members had opinions that our meeting um, topic wasn't emergent, but by the definition of the emergency meeting, it's more, um, has more to do with the time frame, frame in which the minutes are posted and the meeting is out to the public. So if anyone would like to comment or have any discussion on that, um, we can do so at this, this time. All right, this is Dave Calvecchio and I'll be brief because I'm the member who, who, uh, who uh, thinks it wasn't a legal meeting. Um, our bylaws can say whatever they want, but honestly, it's state statute that, that runs this, uh, this, this show. Uh, the superintendent also uh, sent out a legal opinion um, from a while ago as to what a emergency meeting is. And an emergency meeting is a meeting that basically it's gotta be for like safety or health reasons um, where um, there's no time, uh, you don't have enough time to be able to um, uh, notice the meeting and then have it. Basically it's gotta be an emergency. Um, sports, starting sports on Thursday, that Thursday, was not an emergency. Um, so um, basically we can have all the policies and, and bylaws we want, state statute rules this, and we cannot have a meeting for emergency purposes unless it's basically, like I said, 
something that ne needs to be addressed immediately and cannot wait the 24 hours to, um, to be noticed. Sports practice is not an emergency. Thank you for your time. Anybody else have any other discussion or comments on that? Did we meet the criteria what an emergency meeting is listed as? We did. And we, and we consulted uh, the Board of Ed Attorney. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah, this is Sal. I agree with uh, Dave. Um, that meeting, I honestly feel, was not an emergency meeting. Uh, it was just something you wanted to clear off your slate. Uh, that's how I felt. And, you know, people give up a lot of their own time for meetings, and especially emergency meetings. And I just think it was uh, inappropriate to, to have a call or something like that. Beth, this is Francine. The board was educated on what the criteria was uh, for Freedom of Information Act, which is known as FOI or FOIA. Um, they were educated uh, back last February and the document that our uh, Board of Education attorney provided to us included statements regarding emergency meetings. And the reason why Freedom of Information why the commission would be concerned by a last minute meeting, such as an emergency meeting, would be that the public would not be properly noticed. It's not because there is a, an immediate impending catastrophe. It's that one cannot post the meeting. So the conditions of the meeting that, were, that was scheduled for uh, January that's in question is because the meeting was being scheduled for the day after a long weekend, the town hall is where we properly post our meetings. Our town hall closes at noon. The meeting was discussed for um, scheduling uh, so that we would have ample time to allow our uh, staff to respond to whatever result would come from that meeting. And therefore, uh, because the meeting couldn't be posted on Friday. And we had a long weekend because of the January holiday with the Martin Luther King holiday. Having the meeting on Tuesday made it an emergency meeting. Had we not wanted to have it as an emergency meeting, it would have been called a special meeting and it would have had to have waited until Thursday. Just wanna clarify that. The reason for the emergency meeting under FOIA is because we were not able to properly post it, but we have every right as a board to hold a meeting quickly. And I want to emphasize that quickly for us was because we were trying to hold a meeting on a Tuesday after a long weekend when we could not properly post it according to regulations. Thank you. And I would like to add, we wouldn't have been able to have that meeting on a Thursday. We would have had to push it to Friday um, for scheduling purposes. So it would have likely not have happened that week at all and would have been pushed out another week. And I do feel that it was um, regarding health and safety of our students and our athletes. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, anyone? Sorry if I cut you off. The next item on our agenda is um, just an update from our virtual CAB retreat um, that we had this uh, last Thursday, February 4th. And we had uh, four board members, four or five board members in attendance. And um, just a quick recap, um, we had um, a presenter from CAB who went over how do we work uh, more efficiently together um, the role of the Board of Education members, the role of the superintendent. Um, it was about leadership and policy, um, basically the operational um, part over the district is the responsibility of the superintendent and the policy and budget 
falls under the board. Um, so again, it was just a reminder of our roles. We had some really good discussions. Um, and I don't know if anyone who else attended wanted to add anything to the update, feel free. Okay, next we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Beth. This is Francine. Uh, my report begins with correspondence. The first slide is correspondence either sent to me or by me. Second slide should be the same. If we could scroll to the second slide and then the following slide is correspondence from the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education and the US Department of Education. We did not have anything from the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents this month. And we had nothing from the Department of Public Health. The next slide shows correspondence from the State Department of Education in Connecticut, including some updated addenda. So uh, back in July, the state had put out uh, their reopening of schools plan and throughout the year they have been updating it with addendum and these different addendas, addenda, um, keep getting updated. So addendum five has been updated and addendum nine has been updated. Now there's also some uh, great information in there about some professional development and um, uh, things about student performance across the state. The next slide, are the reports that come under my report, which is the administrator reports for February. The key to this section of my report is that the administrator reports contain the February 8, 2021 curriculum guides report. And that report contains 19 updated curriculum guides that I am asking the board to accept and approve as presented this evening. This is Roxy Feiner. I'll make a motion to accept and approve the curriculum guides as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Is there any discussion on the motion? This is Roxy Feiner. I did have a question regarding the social studies curriculum for grade four. In going mm -hmm. over it, I noticed that the compelling questions for units two through six were the same as the learning targets. And I was wondering if that was just a typo or if there was another issue that needed to be addressed there. Uh, hi, Roxy. I'll look at it again, but I believe the, you know, sometimes the learning target is in question form and um, the other one would be in statement form, but I will definitely look at that one again. Is there any other discussion? Is there any opposed? If it is, if it is a typo, okay. Roxy, I'll make sure it's corrected before it goes in the folder, by the way. Thank you, Jessica. Are there any opposed? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Before I continue, I want to be certain there is a, a board member who uh, is having trouble. Uh, he's lost his connection to the meeting. And I know that the host is not seeing him in any kind of waiting room. Uh, Dave, are you there? I'm back. Okay, thank you. I didn't want to go on until we knew you were back in. Uh, so the next uh, slide continues my reports. And thank you, Sue, who's hosting our meeting. Thank you very much for taking care of that. Uh, the next slide, we have our monthly enrollment report, which uh, includes, uh, for most of the year, this year we've been including the distance learning enrollment so that you can look at uh, the numbers of opt-out students by grade level. 
And now I am going to present to you the distance learning uh, report, which is going to contain the uh, suggested instructional model uh, for the next so many weeks. So Sue, if you would go to the next slide, please. So the distance learning report uh, begins with the factors that drive our model choice. So these factors are uh, old news to those of you who have been tuning in since July. Uh, there are two factors that we look at when we make decisions about what our instruction model looks like. One is the spread and prevalence of COVID in our community, and the other is our ability to implement critical mitigation strategies. Uh, back in the summer, uh, and also uh, most recently, the last time we met, uh, there was uh, difficulty and has been for uh, most of the year in acquiring enough staffing to be certain that we have the critical mitigation strategies in place to be implemented, uh, not only with fidelity, but with regularity. Uh, so we have been working with Wednesdays as remote so that we would have that ability to um, manage our mitigation strategies with the staffing that we have. Since October, the uh, spread and prevalence of COVID in the community has become um, a, a main factor, uh, really, and you'll see as we go forward in my report, really we should be fully remote if we were to look at just the indicator of spread and prevalence in the community. Uh, but we'll go on to the next slide and I'll be more specific uh, for the audience. This was a slide that I showed uh, the last time we talked about the instruction model and I, I think it's key, that's why I'm showing it again. So uh, in our world of COVID in the pandemic, we have two directions that we are pulled in when we make this decision. One is uh, the highest level of control of transmission of the virus and of course the other, which is very important to us, the highest level of student engagement. So we have a continuum from fully remote, which of course would be the lowest transmission of virus in our schools because students would not be there, staff would not be there. And then we go to the highest end of our um, continuum, which would be uh, full in-person, which right now is instruction online one day a week with four in-person days, but that could take us up to five days in person where we would have the highest level of engagement, but of course the highest risk of transmission. Next slide, please. Um, I want to point out that this is the information that's posted by the State Department of Education regarding instruction models in use across Connecticut. And it's very important uh, that you understand the definitions of these different headings on this graph. Fully in person means that every single day all children are in person. I don't mean the opt out students. I mean, those who have selected to be in person are in person five days a week. Then there's the mostly in person model, which means more than 75% of the time, but not 100% of the time, all in person students are in person. And then they go to hybrid, which in our district, we called hybrid in the very beginning, the 50% model where half of the students came in two days and were remote three and the other half came in a different two days. Um, in, at the state now, they're using hybrid as any model where in-person is somewhere between 25 and 75%. And then, of course, uh, mostly remote is less than 25% to zero. And then, of course, fully remote is zero days in person. Thomas in Public Schools proudly says that um, we are able to manage our strategies the way that we have been, and we're in that 15% column. We are mostly in person. As you can see, the majority of the state is in hybrid where they are not doing four days a week. Either they're doing shortened days or they are doing fewer than four full days in person, unlike Thomaston. So we have a great deal to be proud of with our mostly in-person model of four days of in-person student um, instruction a week. I wanna to also to emphasize, and you'll see again, we'll bring up that slide that we just saw. So if you would uh, scan to the next slide, it'll be a repeat of one we've just seen. I have to emphasize here, it is absolutely important that we remember that a full in-person model is what we strive for um, with 100% of the students, 100% of the time in person. Uh, but we are still struggling to make certain that that will happen um, with support 
of the mitigating strategies that we need to put in place um, on a regular basis and also in a way that would minimize the spread of the virus. Uh, next slide. So I'll emphasize some of this uh, with our COVID data. And what we have in the next slide is a map of Connecticut. What I said earlier was that if we were to use the original plan, it would indicate that we should be remote, fully remote, because we would be in excess of the threshold uh, that is shown here where it would be uh, 15 or more cases per 100,000. Um, Thomaston, as you see, is red, as is most of the state. I have identified the gray towns. These towns should be fully in person based on just spread in their communities. All other towns should be fully remote, but we know that is not the case, most especially that Thomaston has been able to put our mitigation strategy plan into place to keep spread in our schools lower than it is in our community. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to provide some discussion points on our instruction model. Again, we'll go back to this tug of war between the spread of the virus and student engagement. And we have found that the current model is successful, it is working well for us. The last time we met, we had added the updated addendum five quarantine duration to the model that was in place. And I had asked that that model, the current one that we're in, go through February 11th, which is the day before our long weekend. So tonight, I am providing with an updated instruction model, which is the next slide. And I am asking that this updated instruction model be extended through April. As you can see here, all of the bullets are identical to the original model that you just saw with the exception of the last bullet, which is to allow for controlled spectators for home basketball games. Why would I present this and not present what we were hoping for the last time is um, I think the politely worded question that might be running through many people's heads. The Wednesday synchronous half days continue to be uh, needed because we're at 1.3 full time uh, short in our custodial staffing. In other words, we're about 55 hours short per week. Uh, of custodial staff, even though we have hired uh, more part-time staff, we are still short. So we cannot come back on Wednesdays um, for that reason, but not that reason alone. We also have food service obligations under uh, the pandemic rules that we uh, are living under. So we use our Wednesdays right now to disperse our meals for the opt-out students. They get five packaged meals every Wednesday. And so we looked into a way where we could keep our mitigation strategies going and also be able to have maybe a shortened school day in person for our uh, in-person learners on Wednesday. And when I did that research and asked our food service and uh, food service director and our business manager to, to give me some calculations on cost, uh, it would it would bring us into a level of debt of over $45,000 if we went back just three hours a day on Wednesday because of the cost of making that happen with uh, preparing boxed meals for all students in person and remote. There would also be uh, funding lost um, or exceeded, our spending would be exceeded if we came back for hot lunches with a longer day with the in-person kids and still providing the remote learners uh, their lunches. So at this time, it's also not fiscally uh, prudent to go back uh, on any level on Wednesdays other than in remote. There's also a letter that was written to the Board of Education uh, that spoke to this and there were some key points uh, related to our custodial staff and, and our nursing staff uh, 
I, I don't know, Beth, if you wanted to, to pull an excerpt from that, I'll, I'll leave it open to you. But uh, it's very important that those uh, members of the board that have to make a decision tonight understand that I have uh, spoken with all of the union representatives in our district, and I have paid a great deal of attention to the staff that are working to assure that we have uh, the highest level of student engagement while we also maintain the highest level of um, keeping that virus at a low, low spread across our buildings. And they are my experts and they are those that I rely on and that our parents rely on and that our students rely on um, for a healthy, safe environment while also being a good learning environment. And they are all in support of keeping Wednesdays as remote Wednesdays. So Beth, I'll, I'll take a breath if you want to share anything. Otherwise, I'll go on to the next slide. Um, well, I think uh, the board members should have received um, the email from the AFSCME um, union. And it, it did state the concerns regarding the custodial staff being shorthanded. And then also about the nurses being stretched um, with all the work that they have to do with their daily tasks, their charting, um, and then with the contact tracing, which just go, takes up hours on end and um, that they currently use Wednesdays to catch up to complete their required um, charting emails, calls to parents and staff, um, along with many other duties that could um, not be completed due to the volume of work while the students are present. So um, yeah, we are short um, in other areas. Um, Although Wednesdays are used, for, like Francine, like you have said, for the um, the teachers to um, to plan and touch base with their with their teams. Um, go ahead and continue. So yes, yeah, so instructionally, we have been using our remote Wednesdays in several different ways. So for the younger grades, because we have dedicated remote teachers, online teachers for our opt out students those Wednesdays uh, after the instructional time um, is over the teachers meet and they meet by grade level and they make certain that they are staying in lockstep with each other because they are teaching separately. They are not the same teachers teaching the online students as are teaching the in-person students. At the higher grade levels, grades seven through 12, the teachers are using that time to check in with their remote learners because at seven through to grade seven through 12, our in-person teachers are also the remote teachers. So the time is being used very effectively and it's, it's keeping everyone um, in touch with those students that can't be with us in person, but it's also keeping the students who are uh, learning online and in person synchronized in a way so that when everyone returns to in-person learning, there won't be the haves and the have-nots. There won't be those who need to catch up or who might have um, missed a component because they've had to either be quarantined for a duration of time or because they have officially opted out. Also for special education services, uh, we have students who receive services that um, are opt-out students. Uh, either due to parent choice or because they're medically fragile and there really is no choice but to stay home and be an opt-out student. And our Wednesdays have been used quite well to continue with testing, to continue with providing services that are in their individual education plans. So uh, right now, maintaining the remote Wednesdays uh, would be the smartest option, the best option, uh, the most valuable option uh, as we move closer to uh, the beginning of April, uh, we'll have a better understanding of staffing again, but we are trying very hard. As you can see later in my report, personnel wise, we have been doing a lot of hiring and it's still uh, not getting us to where we need to be to be certain that we can come back on Wednesdays and not diminish any services that we're already uh, providing or quite frankly, to exceed our budget, which is uh, one of the very few things that we are all obligated to as board, be board members under the law to not overspend the purse that's given to us by the town. 
Uh, so I ask for the next slide, please. So what I'm asking for tonight from the board is that, you know, unless indicators require a change, uh, spread indicators require a change in the, in the model, I would like to ask that the board move to continue the model that we already have, adding the component of um, allowing for spectators for basketball in a very controlled fashion and have that run from Tuesday, February 16th through Friday, April 9th. April 9th was selected specifically so that we would be beyond the uh, Department of Public Health predicted March increase in positivity. There is um, a great deal of talk from the State Department of Public Health, as well as the local Torrington area district about how the three new strains are going to impact positivity rates. And they expect that uh, there will be a spike in March. It will also allow us to um, train the new staff that we've recently hired, as well as acquire new staff if uh, the hiring pool expands a bit. We are uh, really in a dearth for new staff at this time. I'm also asking, uh, I'm recommending that the Board of Education convene a meeting on or before March 31st to decide the next instruction model for after the 9th of April. So I ask that the Board of Education um, Take a, make a motion to the effect of my recommended action. This Do is Dave. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. This is Dave Calvacchio. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, um, use the um, model, uh, learning model uh, as presented from Tuesday, February 16th, 2021 through the end of the school year. And I'm basing my, uh, my motion on the fact that I don't think that anything's really going to change. Um, uh, I don't see uh, from what they're saying, teachers aren't going to get uh, vaccines until April, which really means probably be pushed off to May. Um, even if they get vaccinated, they still aren't fully um, vaccinated, if you will, by, you know, their body's going to be another 30 to 45 days, um, which would take us all the way out to the end of the year. Um, financially, uh, the situation is mandated by the state um, to provide lunches for everybody for free. So uh, we have to provide these lunches. Um, the, uh, the deep cleanings on Wednesdays have to occur um, for the safety and well-being of our, of our student population. And I think it would be best for, uh, for all the staff members and the parents um, at this time to just uh, call it. Uh, it. It seems to be working uh, fairly well to have Wednesdays as remote half days and the other days in person. Um, so I'd like to recommend that we, uh, we go as presented through the end of the school year. Do we have a second? I'll, Frank Tregley, I'll second it. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, I, I know I just seconded, but is there any reason why we just can't go to the end of March? And then, you know, maybe we can we have a little bit of hope and then we could always change it then and continue the model we're doing now. Is that possible? Well, Frank, if you, if you want, you can just make another motion and we can just, you know, have a, have a discussion and then vote on one, you know, then just go from there. I mean, that's I'm, I'm perfectly making, acceptable. Okay. I'd like to make another motion if possible. I'd like to continue the model we have until the end of, until April 9th. And prior to that date, we can change it or continue the same way we're going. Is there a second? I'll second Frank's motion. Okay. Any discussion? Roxy, did you want to speak before? I did. I'd like to amend the motion again because we need to add in the basketball spectators under the plan provided by the athletic directors and administration. I think I covered that uh, by saying as presented, you know, um, and I do, I also think that it is important for parents uh, to see their kids, uh, you know, and, and it's important for the student athletes to have their parents uh, see them play in person. Um, so, you know, I think I, I included that in my motion and I think we can, we can include that in Frank's motion as well. 
Any other? I just wanted to be clear that everyone was aware that was part of the motion. Thank you. Thank you both. Excuse me, Beth, this is Francine. I just want to make a note, um, my matter of order, that we have two motions right now that have been seconded. So okay, when okay. we go to take any action, we need to reread or at least identify which motion specifically we are taking action on for clarity. Okay. Shall we just put the first uh, motion to vote and then? It's Sarah. Can I um can I have some discussion on this? Well, yeah, I wanted to just get discussion on the right motion. Okay. So, d is everyone okay with us voting on Dave's motion? Matt Van Armer, I just have a quick question about. Dave's motion. And I, I like the motion. My question is more of the financial aspect of it is never going to change. Is that what we're receiving from the school and the cafeteria? And like the financial burden isn't going to relieve itself in a month. At this time for this is Francine at this time, Matt, we have no uh, financial relief for food service and the COVID funding that we will get uh, will not necessarily apply. So I do not have any relief that I can offer to you at this time. So the figures that I've given to the board are figures that will sustain unless some new funding is offered to us. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, should we just, can Dave just resend his motion and then we can vote on Frank's? I'm trying to get the right process here. You can have discussion, this is Francine, you can have discussion on a motion and then you will take a vote on the motions as they are, uh, as they were called. And then okay. if, if the first is defeated, you go to the second. You, you okay, would not okay. be able to pass both. Right, thank you for clarifying. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, this is Sarah Ethier. I just, I want to say that I really wish we could get the elementary schools in five days a week. Um, I feel like they're losing valuable education. I understand that it probably works way better at the seven to 12, but as a parent and hearing from other parents, the days are very short for the uh, elementary age kids. They really are. Um, it's even to the point where Sutter School has an hour in the middle of their day for specials that that's missed learning time. I mean, here we have, um, you know, these academic committees that we want to get and better our students, but we're not doing that if they're not in school. Um, and it's just the hybrid in the surrounding towns. A lot of them, the K through sixth graders are in school full time and the older kids are hybrid. I just feel like they've lost so much already. And this, this in the middle of the week is very hard, especially for the littler kids. I can't imagine having a kindergartner um, you know, how to explain that you're going to have two days off after being in school for two days. It's just an, it's not a natural break for these kids. And I feel like they're losing a lot of valuable learning. The classes at the high school level also seem to be longer than what we have at the elementary school. I just wish that we could get them into school or have a longer half day because it's, it's basically about two hours worth of learning per Wednesday for those kids. Sarah, this is Francine. Thank you for this information, but I, I have to highlight the value of all instruction and not just the instruction that is not from specialty teachers, because we do provide a full complement of curriculum, including music, art, physical education, technology, and library media at the elementary level. So to say that there is a period of time that's dedicated to those specials um, that's what we, that's the nickname that we give to that group of curriculum, um, those courses. Uh, there's still instruction occurring. It's just uh, instruction in those areas as opposed to in math or reading or um, science or social studies. So I, I want to be certain that we honor those sorry, that sorry. provide yeah, that instruction yeah. and not discount that instruction because it, it's just as valuable and in some ways to um, 
to our students, it's more valuable in their day to participate in that instruction because it's something that they look forward to because it, it feels different and looks different than the classroom instruction. Um, also, the longer half day has been noted. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, and I didn't I didn't mean that at the specials. It, I didn't under I didn't explain myself. It's hard because those specials are recorded. They're not happening live. So the amount of time that's dedicated to them may not be the amount of time that it takes to complete those. So um, I, like at Black Rock, those happen after the, the live instruction from the teachers has happened. So it's more like at the end of the day, like added to the day. It makes their day a little bit longer. I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't um, say that before. And I, I don't I don't mean any disrespect to those specials teachers. My husband is a specials teacher. So I, I absolutely, they are very valuable. It's just maybe we could have them put at the end of the day so that the kids have a little bit more to do then. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. That was gonna be one of my questions. I wasn't sure if this, those specials at the elementary level were synchronous or asynchronous. Beth, this is Francine. The specials at the elementary level are recorded because the specials are taught uh, the same lesson across the um, curriculum, okay. across the grade level, excuse me. So there is one lesson. So if we were in person and, and the pandemic did not exist, Every third grader, for example, would go to music at some point during the course of a week. And that music lesson would be the same for every third grader, even though it's not at the same time. So because we have this now pandemic circumstance, the specialty teachers have been uh, told to record their lessons because sometimes the lessons for an online student have to be different because they don't necessarily have the equipment or the space to complete what would have been in person and further because they are the same lesson for all in that grade level. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any other discussion on the motion or the motions I should say? Uh, this is Heather Patchell. I just uh, first I want to commend the 80s for getting fans, uh, parents rather, into games. My only plea to AJ Scons, maybe even uh, to Preston, is maybe moving um, the boys and girls at least one game, middle school game, over to the high school. So at the very least, eighth grade parents could could maybe see their kids play. Um, that's just my my only suggestion. Thank you, Heather. Um, let's take a vote on uh, Dave's motion, the first motion that was put on the table um, to approve the instructional model with the athletic um, spectator guidelines as presented from February 16th through the end of the school year. Are there any opposed? Sarah Ethier, I'm opposed. I just for the day. Oh, is that Sal? I'm sorry, you're breaking up, Sal. Uh, yes, it was me. Okay. Opposed, yes. Opposed, yes. Okay. Frank Tregley opposed. Heather Patchell opposed. Do we have Matt still on? Uh, this is Beth. I oppose to, so that would defeat the motion. 
Okay, next we'll vote on Frank's motion, which is to accept and approve the instructional model as presented with the athletics um, spectator guidelines um, from February 16th, 2021 through April 9th, 2021 with the Board of Education to convene a meeting on or before March 31st, 2021. That's what you said, right, Frank? Yes, I mean, I just figure we have some hope. It's easy to- Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll take the vote. Are there any opposed? Sarah Ethier, I'm opposed to the hybrid, but I do think that the sports uh, should be have should have spectators. Any other opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much for considering and for accepting my recommendation. The next item that I have in my report is the district calendar, which was tabled from last month. Uh, before you take any action, I'm asking that the board here um, for the sake of, of newer members and for the public to understand because the 2021-2022 district calendar was already approved last year and because I had asked at the last meeting to consider some changes to that calendar related to the possibility of using remote learning days instead of traditional snow days. And because it was tabled until this meeting, the uh, item, the agenda item was left as written from the last meeting uh, for consistency sake. I am telling you that since that meeting, I have met with our unions, but I have also heard no positive whispers from the State Department of Education that remote learning will be permissible in lieu of a traditional snow day for the 21-22 school year. So I'm asking that even though the suggestion here on the agenda is to accept and approve my proposed changes from last month, I am asking that the board consider tabling this action until further notice because the 2122 calendar is already approved with traditional snow days as it always has been. But until we know that the state will permit remote in lieu of traditional snow days, I think that any action other than tabling would be moot. Thank you for explaining that, Francine. Do, do we have a motion? Do we have a motion to table the approval of the 2021-2022 um, district calendar? Frank Tragley will make a motion to table the 2021-2022 district calendar. Is there a second? Heather Patchell, second. Any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. If I get any additional information, I will bring it back to the board. Uh, next 
component of my report, we have contracts, grants, general information, and then we move into personnel. Uh, under contracts, we have a contract with the Watertown Board of Education that is for a tuition um, plan for the PATHS program. Uh, we have an updated school readiness competitive quality enhancement grant, which is for our preschool program. And then for fundraisers, our policy requires that when we receive a gift or a donation, whether it's an identified donor or an anonymous donor, that we need to consider it um, through the fundraising uh, policy. So that is why you see that gift that was made to our varsity field hockey team of jackets and long sleeve t-shirts um, under fundraising. We did not solicit it, it was a gift. Um, under personnel, we have two new hires. And the next slide will show you our transfers and or new assignments. Um, there are 11 of them. The next slide shows that we have no uh, resignations. Um, and it also shows that we have two retirements. And I'd like to take a moment to highlight these uh, retirements. Uh, Mr. Dwan has been a member of our faculty uh, for 28 years this September. And um, he, has, uh, he has given us notice that he is going to begin his new life as a retiree and we will miss him greatly. I am confident that members of our own board are familiar with Mr. Dwan because of his years with us in the classroom. Um, also, Mr. Newsom, uh, George is our uh, custodian at, at Center School. He's been our lead custodian there for many years. Uh, he has been with us for 53 years and he is more than a fixture. He is a chronological warehouse of information about each building, including even buildings we no longer use as schools. He is someone that is a go-to for me personally whenever there is a facilities question. Both of these gentlemen will be sorely, sorely missed next year. I don't know if anybody else would like to make a comment before I go on to renewals and stipends. Just that we accept the, those resignations with regret. As we get closer, we will um, make a note to celebrate uh, these two gentlemen as they go onward to uh, their new world as retirees. Um, as we get closer to the retirement, we will make a note of it. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Dwan, and thank you very much, Mr. Newsom, for your years of service to Thomaston. Continuing on under personnel, we have no renewals at this time, but we do have nine stipended positions that require action. At this time, I ask that the Board of Education acknowledge my notification of personnel, specifically the new hires, transfers, retirements, uh, stipends, um, per policy 4112-4212, as presented. Do we have a motion? This is Roxy Feiner. I vote to acknowledge the superintendent's notification of personnel, specifically new hires, transfers, retirements, resignations, renewals, and stipends per policy 4112-4212 personnel, certified, non-certified appointment and conditions of employment as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Is there any discussion on the motion? I actually have a question, Francine. I was just wondering um, if there was any um, applicants or interest with the custodial positions that are posted. Uh, yes, we are right now in process of reassigning by voluntary transfer requests, any custodians that are um, currently employed by us into two different positions. We have a class one, which is our lead custodian. Um, which would be Mr. Uh, Newsom's position. And we also have a class 
two, which is um, Mr. Turner's uh, position. Um, once we fill those positions, then um, we will see what positions are vacated and we will continue posting positions. One of the things I'd like to highlight though to the public that's listening is ultimately I anticipate two brand new hires will be yielded from um, all of these internal uh, voluntary transfers. So I ask that uh, if there's anyone out there that might be interested in working in the evenings in any one of our school buildings that they contemplate applying and uh, take a look at the application that we have online. If you go to our website and go to human resources, you will see employment opportunities there and you can explore what that position would have um, for hours and for salary. Thank you for the opportunity to say that. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Are there any opposed? Any abstain? This is Roxy Finer, I abstain. Motion carries. Um, is that, I think that's it for your report, Francine? Just to the, the common um, follow-up to personnel, we have three employees who have requested family medical leave. We have no new interns or student teachers. We have no out-of-state field trips. We do have um, a request that I have granted for uh, Mr. Andronowitz to uh, dispose of obsolete books. So that is just a notification to the board. No action is necessary at this time. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the committee reports. Do we have a report from um, the budget audit committee? If uh, no one is interested in making the report, I can do it for you. That's fine, Francine, thank you. Okay, uh, the budget audit committee met uh, last Wednesday. And at that time, uh, we discussed the items that you see before you. Uh, the December um, business manager's report was presented last month to this committee. And the January uh, business manager's report was presented this past Wednesday. Um, with that, um, one of the items that came up for discussion had to do with next year's fiscal year operating budget. Uh, after our meeting as a board on the 25th of January, uh, our business manager was notified by the town's business manager that our debt service payment to the town was smaller than um, we had budgeted for. So the budget audit committee uh, decided that they would update the 2021-2022 fiscal year operating budget and adjust it to lower the amount of money um, being put aside for the debt service payment. Um, I want to be uh, specific. Uh, so on January 25th, we had asked for a town allocation of $15,858,880. Since then, there has been a reduction in our debt service of $11,916. So now the new town allocation for our budget would be $15,846,964. So I am uh, pointing out to the board tonight that based on what you see before you, three actions need to be taken um, as a result of our budget audit committee meetings in December and January. The first being the approval of the December business manager's report. The second being the approval of the adjustment of the 21-22 fiscal year operating budget as described. And the third being the approval of the business manager's report for January. Is 
This is Roxy Finer. I vote to accept approve a business and finance report and expenditures per policy 3432, 3433 business non instructional operations, business and budget expense report, annual financial statement for December as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. This is Roxy Finer. I vote to accept approve the 2021-2022 fiscal year operating budget adjustment as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, this is Roxy Finer. I just want to um, state that um, the administration team did a wonderful job coming in with this budget. And as we move forward for the process that we probably are going to see this budget come back month after month with the adjustments that come from either savings that we find um, through things like the debt service reduction or through budget cuts by the Board of Finance. So I just want the members of the board and public to understand um, that this is a work in progress as we move forward. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Roxy. Any other discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. This is Roxy Finer. I vote to accept approve business and finance report and expenditures per policy 3432, 3433, business non-instructional operations, budget and expense report, annual financial statement for January as presented. Heather Patchell, second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Next, uh, do we have an update from the policy committee? Yeah, this is Sarah. Um, we talked about the upcoming CABE conference that's happening, I think March 17th, and that it'll be virtual and that it's a really good experience for board members. If they have some time, then it would be great if they could um, attend. And uh, we have the fast track to of the um, below listed policies that we talked about last month. Thank you, Sarah. Um, do we have a motion? Um, the first motion from the policy committee. Which looks like it's to fast track the approval of policy 4000.1, 5145.44 and policy 052.1 per Thomaston Board of Education bylaws. This is Heather Patchell. I vote to fast track those two policies per Thomas and Board of Education bylaws. Roxy Finer, second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Beth, this is Francine. For the purpose of uh, newer board members and the public, I would like to explain what fast track means. So Continue. policies. Thank you. So uh, under our bylaws, uh, in order for us to adopt or amend a policy or even formulate one, um, bylaws 9311 indicate that policies will be considered after two regular meetings of the Board of Education. Otherwise, if we need to move faster on a policy, then we will secure two thirds vote of the members present at the board meeting when the where the request is made so that we don't have to wait two more months to approve these policies. 
The policies that are before you tonight are good candidates for fast track because they have been in discussion since October, but they have not gone through the two regular meetings um, as a first read and a second read like we typically do. They are also uh, policies related to um, particular law that we need to have updated in order to be in compliance. Hence, it's also um, a very good candidate for what we call the fast track. So I just felt that that was a necessary uh, explanation for those who are uh, listening who may not understand what fast track means. Thank you, Francine. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Are there any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Do we have a motion to vote to accept and approve policy uh, 4,000 point? Oh, is that what we just, I'm sorry. Are they separated out on the they agenda? They are. So on the agenda, the first action item was to allow for a fast track of 4,000.1 slash 5145.44 and policy 0521.1. Thank now you. that we have permission to fast track, now we can approve those policies as presented without waiting. Thank you. Do we have a motion? This is Heather Patchell. I vote to accept policy 4000.1 slash 5145.44 as presented. Roxy Finer second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. This is Heather Patchell. I vote to accept policy 0521.1 as presented. Roxy Finer second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. And this is Heather Patchell. I vote to eliminate pol policy 4118.112 slash 4218-112 and policy 5145.5 as these policies are redundant to policy 4000.1 and 41, uh, excuse me, 5145.44. Roxy Finer second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Are there any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Heather Patchell, motion to adjourn. Roxy Matt Van Omer second. Any discussion on the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Thank you for your time, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.